Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, let's start with our session. Uh, our challenge is that we have a time slot of only one hour and we want to uh, use uh, the time slot uh, we got uh, allocated. Uh, and uh, I think our session is announced as a kind of conversation. Uh, so therefore, don't be disappointed uh, that uh, uh, we, we are not going to present slides. Uh, some of the panelists had already prepared uh, slides, uh, but I asked them that not uh, to use them because I think we would like uh, to keep uh, our panel as lively as possible uh, and uh, to have uh, really a conversation uh, here, a discussion. Yeah, I think uh, uh, we are in a, the privileged uh, situation that uh, uh, we have also a very uh, distinguished uh, panel and I'd like uh, to start by introducing the panel members. Uh, so uh, we have uh, Hélène Michard uh, with us uh, sitting over there. Uh, so she is, uh, uh, works in the European uh, Commission, Director General for Taxation and Customs Union and uh, represents uh, the European uh, Commission, which is uh, very important for our topic. Uh, then we have uh, Professor Valente, who is uh, from Italy, uh, has also some academic affiliation, but uh, today he is here in his capacity as president of the CFE of the Confederation Fiscale Européenne. Uh, we have uh, John Peterson, who is originally from New Zealand and is a senior policy advisor uh, with the OECD in uh, Paris. Uh, then I'd like uh, to introduce uh, Melchior Vatlet, uh, who is an advocate general at the European uh, Court of Justice, uh, used to be uh, a judge, and I think uh, it's uh, fair to say that uh, by coincidence, but maybe not by coincidence, and I'm sure you will not comment on that, uh, you had been a judge in a a period uh, where uh, the European Court of Justice was very uh, internal market friendly, if I may say so, and also uh, very uh, taxpayer rights uh, friendly. I think uh, at least uh, that uh, was always my perception. I think uh, you exercised a lot of influence on the judgments of the uh, Court of Justice. And now, as an advocate general, of course, uh, your opinions are also uh, well respected and very visible. In your former life, uh, uh, in his former life, Melchior had been a Minister of Justice in Belgium and also a Vice uh, Premier Minister in Belgium. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, Annette uh, kugelmüller poo uh, with us uh, on uh, my right-hand side, left-hand side from uh, your uh, perspective. Uh, so Annette is a, a judge at the Federal Tax Court, uh, the Bundesfinanzhof, which is the Supreme uh, Tax Court in uh, Germany. Yeah, uh, having introduced uh, the uh, panel, I'd uh, like uh, to start with our topic, uh, which is kind of vague because uh, uh, we are supposed to talk about uh, international institutional actors on the scene, what is their role in protecting uh, taxpayers' rights. And uh, of course, it's uh, maybe already a debate in itself who is an international actor who is uh, what is such an institution uh, but i think uh, uh, we have uh, the benefit we have the privilege uh, that we have representatives of some institutions here on the panel who uh, definitely count and are uh, key players in that uh, kind of game so therefore uh, the first uh, around discussion round should be on the question how could taxpayers right uh, be protected and what is the role of intergovernmental international institution and i'd like uh, to invite uh, Professor Valente uh, to start because the CFE is one of uh, the institution organizations uh, which uh, does a lot of work in that area and uh, has also uh, done work on uh, taxpayer uh, charter. So maybe you would like to start. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I would divide my presentation into two different areas. A few words on uh, transparency in the framework of BEPS and uh, taxpayers' rights and uh, a model taxpayer charter. Uh, let's start with uh, transparency. Um, 
Base erosion and profit shifting has become lately a key political issue at the uh, worldwide level. And as everybody knows, uh, our tax systems were designed about 100 years ago based on two pillars, concrete borders that can be controlled and defended, and sovereign states. They were made of uh, uh, territorial rules to regulate domestic activities, domestic taxpayers, and fixed and tangible assets. Uh, globalization has been a, a game changer, and uh, it transformed the fixed to mobile and the tangible to intangible. So in such context, uh, territorial rules were never meant to fit. And uh, struggling to fit uh, uh, the ultra-territorial reality to territories, we have only created the mismatches and black holes, and where the taxable income gets lost and where BEPS is born. So the 15 actions BEPS project under the aegis of the OECD and G20 enjoys the support of over 100 jurisdictions. And within the EU, the BEPS strategy is called ATAD. Um, ATAD, it intends to meet the same purposes as the OECD project. But the BEPS project is not only about the EU or about uh, uh, developed country, countries. I will not expand on BEPS actions, but I would like to briefly refer to the key messages of the project. Countries have digested the reality that the rules of the game have changed and that the game is now global. And the existing norms need to be changed and our laws to fit current reality. And to a certain extent, cooperation must prevail to competition. In this sense, the OECD, the EU, and the UN, and other intergovernmental organizations have a key role. Uh, they are in a position to define policies, to give the floor to the different stakeholders and promote capacity building through dialogue and sharing of know-how. So the BEPS actions are comprehensive and to a certain extent well balanced. But global policy may only rely on increased transparency regarding the activities of large companies and in particular regarding few points. First of all, profits made where the profits are generated, taxes on the profit paid, subsidies received, and tax rolling. So the significance of transparency is uh, definitely recognized in an ongoing effort to rebuild the international system. And the balanced discussion should be able to lead to balanced uh, rules. And the balanced discussion can take place solely under the acknowledgement of the need for effective protection of the fundamental rights of taxpayers. And such protection must be adequate and timely. So let's move now to my second topic, which is the taxpayers' rights. I would like to stress that in the framework of the BEPS pro project, taxpayers' fundamental rights should be ensured. Uh, CFE as the umbrella organization of tax advisors in, in Europe, has uh, tried to promote a taxpayer charter model. This was proposed by CFE and by the association, the Asia Oceania Association of Tax Consultant and STEP, which is the Society of Trust and the State Practitioners. The first edition was in 2013, the second edition in 2016, and this model reflects our ideal for taxpayers' rights at global level. The latest model was compiled following a survey in 41 jurisdictions representing 80% of the worldwide GDP. The survey, uh, before the compilation of the model taxpayer charter, indicated important deficiencies in the protection of taxpayers' rights. First of all, the scope of taxpayers' rights was not always comprehensive. Non-binding taxpayer charters were substantially ignored. The recognition of taxpayers' rights was often hesitant and or generic. There was a severe lack of accountability on the part of tax administration, and there was a complete lack of established standards 
for the legislative process, including drafting or relevant tax legislation. So the model taxpayer charter evolves in uh, 37 articles, which cover a wide scope of issues arising in the relations between taxpayers and tax authorities. For example, audit process, voluntary disclosure, double taxation, and relief. Um, CFE was pleased to see that its charter was used within the EU work on taxpayer code. There are, in essence, nine key points included in the model taxpayer charter on which we believe that further protection of taxpayers is necessary. First of all, the establishment of quality standards for the drafting of tax legislation, firm introduction of principle of non-retroactivity of tax legislation, the clear positioning of tax advisors in the national and international tax scenario as enablers of tax compliance, the clarification of boundaries between tax evasion and tax avoidance, and the establishment of standards with regard to the measures to curb them, the promotion of solutions to the issue of double taxation, which constitutes one of the most important incentives of tax avoidance, and detailed reference of taxpayers' rights and obligation in the audit process. Um, worldwide acknowledgement of, of the privilege to communications between taxpayers and tax professionals with the view of strengthening the right to effective legal remedy in the framework of tax dispute. To conclude, um, due to the implementation of the BEPS recommendation at domestic level and considering expected spillovers, taxpayers' charter of rights or codes play a crucial role in the new international tax landscape. Uh, if we are to move towards greater tax fairness, the dynamics be behind the taxpayer tax authorities relationship need to be grounded on mutual trust, more transparency and cooperation. And this should be reflected in a clear definition of rights and obligation for each of them, taxpayer and tax authorities. And through these means, we will be able to reduce the cost of compliance, increase the voluntary compliance, and ensure that all taxpayers are treated fairly, equally, and without bias or preference. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, the BEPS project had been mentioned several times, and of course uh, the OECD is in the driver's seat for that project. Uh, my impression had been that uh, taxpayers' right was not uh, a main part of the BEPS uh, project, uh, uh, but maybe uh, you will provide us with a different position, John. Yeah, it would be fair to say that um, uh, taxpayer rights was not one of the, uh, the headline issues that uh, the OECD was dealing with as part of the, uh, the BEPS project. Uh, a lot of the work that the OECD did in the space of taxpayer rights goes back to um, uh, the time when Jeffrey was, uh, was heading up the organisation and we did quite a bit of work in that space in the early 2000s. Um, and we went quiet on that for a bit, but the excellent work that the CFE and the European Commission have done in recent times has done an extensive job in building on that original work and carefully delineating uh, those taxpayer rights. Um, and it's clear, I think we did a survey, uh, the tax administration survey that we did in 2013 and the 2015 uh, report that came out indicated that of the, all the FTA countries, which is effectively OECD and G20, Almost, almost all those countries had some formalisation of those taxpayer rights. So, uh, so there has been, I think, uh, significant progress in terms of identifying what those rights need to be uh, and specifying them uh, in tax administrations. The, uh, the next step, I think, then, is turning those rights into practice, taking them from the words uh, into reality. Um, and 
there is an opportunity I think we now see, uh, particularly uh, in, in the aftermath of the BEPS project where commentators have legitimately said, look, if you, if you move the fundamentals around the way the international tax system is structured, you're going to expect more uncertainty, uh, more, uh, more disagreements between taxpayers and tax administrations, but also between tax administrations, and you need to think seriously about those implications. And I think the developments uh, that Christoph referred to uh, in relation to the G20 tax certainty agenda uh, really create a, a, an ideal time for us to go back and look at this uh, topic more comprehensively. I also think that um, taxpayer rights are, are well placed in this sense because they really speak to the expectations between a tax administration and a taxpayer, what, uh, what taxpayers can expect from tax administrations and what tax administrations can expect from taxpayers in terms of the way they deal with each other, building on that sense of trust and that sense of social capital which is a key issue for international organisations. The IMF, the OECD, the World Bank are very much interested in uh, issues around social capital and the ability to, uh, to, to leverage social capital to get more efficient and fairer outcomes. So I do think that the time is right for a refocus on this issue, particularly from an OECD perspective, where I would certainly say it's not been, I would agree with you, it's not been one of our uh, our top headline issues in the last uh, 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Elaine, we, uh, the European Commission had also been mentioned and uh, quite recently has picked up a lot of the BEPS ideas, but at the same time I think has also uh, initiated uh, some uh, uh, ideas also in the area of uh, 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 taxpayers' protection. So maybe you would like to explore on that a bit? Thank you. Um, we, I, I will maybe um, seems to be so to to go in different direction because I will spare the umbrella and the legal framework and all that stuff. I will concentrate on the kind of experience we are currently uh, working on and with the member states, with the business. Um, we, I belong to a, um, to um, a unit where we're dealing with tax compliance, tax administration, fight against fraud, administrative cooperation. Uh, for VAT mainly, but also as um, cooperation, mutual cooperation and recovery of, uh, of tax claims, these um, concern all the type of, um, of taxation. So um, I'll just take some, some example of what we're currently doing. Um, well, this is uh, a general point for the whole Commission, drafting um, a proper legislation is something that should be uh, kept well, uh, sound and, 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 uh, and, and easy to read. Um, this is uh, the programme uh, that you know, better regulation, refit and all that stuff, and we're contributing actively to uh, implement this in our own proposal. Now, as you know, a proposal is a proposal, meaning that it's only a draft and that it would go to the Council and the Parliament, where, um, well, it happens what happens. And uh, in particular, um, it's uh, said that uh, those type of uh, legislation, those type document, can have a certain level of in, in, in big BT, because otherwise there is no agreement, which is a load um, diplomatic sources says. Um, that's, the, that's also a point. Um, we also have uh, endeavoured to facilitate um, the uh, possibility for a, a, an open dialogue between uh, taxpayers and um, tax administration on a voluntary basis. The reason why we have created the EU VAT Forum, which is um, quite a specific expert group where you do find at the same, around the same table the business as well as tax, tax administration, which is quite new. And it took us two years to come to the this result, well, it gives you an idea of the need to change the mindset uh, we, we were talking yesterday about. Um, so it creates a new environment. Of course, trust is um, the main, uh, um, the main um, important uh, feature. And uh, we, we put on the table uh, issues about implementing the current regulation. And we give the way, the opportunity to discuss about how to smoothen the implementation of those provisions, which are, for quite a, a lot of them, 
difficult to implement in a homogeneous way between the member states. So uh, in this respect, we are currently in a pilot phase of um, uh, an experience called the EU VAT cross-border ruling. So, um, well, don't jump out of your um, seat ruling. Uh, there are bad rulings and good rulings, like the cholesterol. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and so, I pretend this is a good one. Um, it's, a, it's an experience. It's not something uh, that we... Um, that we, we, um, we are completely uh, ahead of. Um, we have found that, that the, well, the need for legal certainty, at least for certainty for the transaction, is enormous among the business and, and they are willing to comply unless they are told the, 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 the way to comply. So we, um, just on a voluntary basis, we just um, suggested that um, we can have uh, a, new, a new way of dealing with such a question uh, of the treatment, the VAT treatment of certain transactions in just have, opening the possibility for a taxpayer to seize its own uh, tax authority so it can ask about the treatment of another member state um, or for transactions that are envisaged by the business. So the business can find a place and a contact point where it can ask for what would be the, the right way to comply in this kind of transaction and it has to describe um, in detail the, 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 uh, uh, the transaction envisaged. Until now, um, so once this, um, is, this query request has been sent to, to the tax administration, the tax administration contacts its uh, counterpart, well, one of the 18 participating member states, uh, and try to set up with a solution on how to define the VAT treatment. Well, a kind of example of a question could be, um, that could be uh, solved in this informal process is, for instance, about um, e-service uh, or, or, um, um, or, or normal, normal service or, or well, distribution of good, well, delivery of good. When, you de when you're dealing with uh, intermediation services um, related to, um, to, to housing, uh, letting, um, selling, selling houses, when this kind of operation is made through uh, a computer um, intervention. So you do have a, a dilemma whether you should consider, at what point you should consider this kind of, of, of transaction as an e-service or, uh, or as a normal, as a normal uh, transaction related to estate and uh, related to intermediation services. So this kind of, uh, of dilemma is not because the legislation isn't clear, uh, clear it's because the, the way in the, the facts and the way the, the, the operation are dealt with is absolutely um, essential to define the very nature of the transaction and deduct the, uh, tr the, the treatment, that treatment, the operational, the, 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 the right one. Well, if we put that in a very, very um, positive situation, it happens, it has happened now 16 times uh, that uh, the member state agreed between toge together and come up with an answer for the taxpayer. Well, this is it. And all that um, dialogue and condition, the procedure for the rulings, obey to the national legislation. So there is no intervention, there is no interference in the two, into the procedure. There is a, a proper use of the mechanism of mutual assistance and administrative cooperation that are just uh, uh, tested there. Um, so th that is what we're currently doing. We, it's a pilot. We have. Um, scarce, we have a very limited number of cases, but the, the, the final thing is that the cases where there, is a, there has been an agreement are published, and there, there is, I come back to my good ruling, because it's transparent, it's not a ruling which is adopted by one single member state preempting the solution of, the, of another, it's uh, something that is, has been discussed in the open, 
it is published. It is uh, also something that you can uh, you can use um, of uh, with um, other experience uh, from from other taxpayers. Uh, this is a, a very, very uh, specific point. I just wanted to, talk, um, to, 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 to present you. We are currently just doing some kind of uh, communication <laughs> issues on this because we, we, we definitely want to have more cases and, and try to, to, to be well able to make progress into this pilot project. Um, so I will be uh, happy to um, tell you more about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for providing us with uh, that example, which I think is uh, interesting and maybe also typical because uh, if I understand uh, the approach correctly, it's a combination of uh, soft law elements, uh, building up trust, uh, uh, developing the culture further together with hard law elements, uh, having a ruling, uh, providing legal certainty. And that uh, reminds me of a lot of the topics we've discussed uh, yesterday as well. Yeah, are there any immediate uh, reactions, responses, questions to that? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, we'll get the mic. Uh. Thank you very much for the um, insights so far. Uh, I have one question uh, regarding the um, EU VAT rulings. Uh, you mentioned that they are published. I just tried to find a published one online, but it seems that it's just a summary, very briefly. So do you publish the, the whole ruling, um, or how, how does this look like? How much is really, really um, available to the public? Thank you. Quick answer. Uh, yeah. The, the, the uh, <laughs> well, the, um, the publication is is uh, for on the public site of the uh, of Europa. It's uh, just um, in the library, and it has been anonymous uh, um, authorization or anonymously um, been corrected just uh, to make sure that the um, uh, neither the business has pro a problem with this ruling nor the member states involved more than one because it's cross border rulings of course. Um, so it's uh, it's really it depends on what the ruling has been uh, um, on how it has been made by the the member state that just adopted this ruling. So it can be summary because they they don't have any any further things, or it can be a longer thing. Uh, we also published the dissentive opinion uh, if the member state agree. So again, it's a coalition of the willing this project, and so it takes what every one every member state has to offer. Okay, thank you very much. So I suggest we continue with our uh, second uh, round, uh, namely the question, uh, what could be the role of the courts? On the one hand, I think it's obvious uh, that uh, uh, the courts are crucial in protecting uh, taxpayer rights, but uh, I think uh, maybe there are uh, some uh, developments uh, which uh, should be emphasized, and I'd like uh, to call upon Melchior uh, to start with the uh, European experience, the experience of, from the perspective of the Court of Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to speak uh, about the case law of the Court of Justice and about the protection of the taxpayer rights. Of course, I'm not going to speak about the fight against evasion and fraud, which has become, it was not, but which has become, in the case law of the Court of Justice, an overriding reason of general interest to justify, for example, restriction to the free movement of goods, persons, or capital. I'm not speaking either about the case law about abuse of law. The concept of abuse of law has been developed by the case law of the Court of Justice in the field of taxation. I'm going to speak about protection of the taxpayer rights and with four recent decisions. And I'm not going to skip any of them. <laughs> first, first problem, first problem. When a tax has been uh, levied in breach of EU law, it has all been, always been decided by the Court of Justice that it should be refunded. That's the consequence, the complement of 
the rights conferred by the treaty on taxpayers. And it includes losses coming from the unavailability of the sums. That's to say, refund plus interests. We are in 2013, we have a case asking to the court, yes, but from the day of the payment of the tax, or interest should be paid from the day following the date of the claim for repayment. And the court says, you have the right to have a full compensation of the losses. And that was the Romanian system. And the court said it deprives the taxpayer from a part of the compensation if the interest is only paid later than the date of payment of the tax. But you know, the member states that have difficulties to understand things very rapidly. So we have now two pending cases where there is, once again, a state about reimbursement of overpaid VAT, that's an Hungarian case, and the state has decided, I'm going to reimburse overpaid VAT only at the end of the investigation I have against the taxpayer, without any interest, without any interest, even if, says the national judge, if the investigation is lasting years, without any responsibility of the taxpayer. I leave you the surprise of the decision of the court because it's not yet taken. We have another case, Commission against Ireland, an infringement action. And the member state had invented something else. Okay, I am going to reimburse the tax. Okay, I am going to pay interest. Okay, from the date of payment of the tax. So everything is positive. Yes, but I am going to deduct administrative costs of the reimbursement. That's the case Commission against Ireland. There, there is an opinion of a, one of my colleagues, the Advocate General Spoonar, who said that it should be refunded with interest from the date of payment and without deduction of any administrative costs. Second cases. Web mined licenses. That's a decision of the court of uh, end of 2015 where I delivered my opinion. And there was a problem of abuse of law, possible abuse of law. In my opinion, I did not think that there was an abuse of law. The court did not say that there was an abuse of law, but it left to the referring judge, the referring judge, Hungarian judge, he left, the court left the, the power to define whether there was an abuse of law or not. But the question was, if there is an abuse of law, is it possible for a tax administration to use evidence without any knowledge of the taxpayer, knowledge, uh, evidence obtained in the context of a parallel criminal procedure by means of interception of telecommunications or by seizure of mails? And the court, consistently with my opinion, said you have to respect the rights granted by the European Union and namely the right to respect for the private and family life and also the right to an effective judicial remedy. So the national judge in this case has to check whether the interception of telecommunication, whether the seizure of mails were provided in national law by law, were necessary, had to check whether the right of the defense had been respected, to check whether the taxpayer had the opportunity in the administrative procedure to have access to the evidence and to be heard on these elements. And says the court, the national judge has to have the power in the national law to check that the evidence was obtained in the criminal procedure according to the rights conferred by, namely, 
the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Third case, about the interpretation of the Directive on Administrative Cooperation in the Field of Tax, Directive 2011-16. The objective of this directive is to combat, of course, tax evasion, and the case is about the balance between administrative efficiency on the one side and respect for the citizens' rights and more especially the right to an effective judicial remedy for the taxpayer. That the case Berlioz, there was a request from the French administration to Luxembourg in the context of the examination of the fiscal situation of a French company, Cofima, which paid dividends to a company in Luxembourg, holding company Berlioz, with exemption of withholding tax. And the French tax administration wanted to ascertain whether the French conditions were complied with for this exemption. Berlioz gave information to the administration of Luxembourg, but not all of them. And so Berlioz received a fine of 250,000 euros and brought an action before the judge of Luxembourg. But in the law of Luxembourg, the taxpayer has the right to bring an action against the decision imposing the fine, about the proportionality of the fine, about the amount, but the taxpayer has no right to bring an action to review the legality of the information order received by the taxpayer from the administration of Luxembourg. And the judge of Luxembourg asks to the court, is it consistent with European law? European law, and more especially, the right to an efficient judicial remedy, Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. I've delivered my opinion in this case, and we are waiting for the decision of the court. My opinion is that the Charter is applicable, first, Second, the judge should have an unlimited jurisdiction not only to assess the proportionality of the fine, but also to review the legality of the information order on which the penalty is ordered. Because an efficient judicial remedy, it means that the judge cannot be bound by an information order taken unilaterally by the administration. All the more because the directive says the requesting state, in this case France, they cannot fish for information, no fin fishing expeditions. It can only ask for information which is foreseeably relevant, foreseeably relevant to assess the tax situation of the French taxpayer. And so this criterion of foreseeably relevant should be checked by the requested authority from Luxembourg and therefore I propose to the court to say it should be also checked by the judge. First step. Second step, of course, a fundamental right is not unlimited. It can be limited for good reasons and in a proportionate way. So here I'm taking into account the objective of the directive to combat tax evasion. So it should be a rapid procedure. It should be led discreetly. And I propose to the court that this control of the judge should be marginal, should be limited, limited because of course Combat tax evasion is an overriding of general interest and the judge should limit his control to the existence of a link between the taxpayer, the required information, the request to the authority, requested authority, Luxembourg in this case, 
and also the objective pursue. And should only quash the information order if there is a manifest deficiency. Last question. Should the judge be in possession of the French decision, of the French request? And I propose to the court to say yes, or is it possible to check the information order without having the decision of the French administration requesting the information? Last but not least, Tarico case, an Italian case, decision of the court in September 2015. But pay attention, there is a judgment of the court, but the story is not at its end. The story is that there were people charged with very, very heavy offenses in the field of VAT, carousel arrangements, shell companies, use of false documents, offenses committed between 2005 and 2009. And we are in 2014. The, there is a limitation period in Italy, seven years, can be interrupted, but after the, interrupted, it, the, the interruption, the limitation period is only extended by the quarter of the initial period. And in this case, the limitation period expires in February 2018. So for the taxpayer, no problem, impunity warranted. Complex investigation and the Italian judge, not the Court of Cassation, not the Supreme Court, the judge of first instance is asking us have the file, there is a limitation period, and I tell you, Court of Justice, you know, the restriction of the limitation period in Italy has the effect. That's not, I, I do not say that, that's the referring judge who tells us there is a de facto impunity. And the de facto impunity in these type of cases, that's not an exception, that's the rule. Two question of the Italian judge. Is it not a new exemption of VAT created by the system and non present in the directive? Second question. Article 325 of the treaty says to the member state, you have to counter illegal activities affecting the financial interest of the European Union. And of course, as the European Union receives a part of the VAT, of course, 325 can be applied. And the court says, okay, the penalties imposed by the Italian legislation, seven years, up to seven years of imprisonment, that's effective, that's dissuasive. Sure, seven years, okay. Second, limitation period, okay. But, says the court, if the practical result of the system in general, heavy penalties, but never applied, <laughs> it's not effective and dissuasive in practice. So says the court to the judge, you have to disapply the Italian legislation about the limitation period. Why is the story not finished? Because the case went to the Court of Cassation, Supreme Court. We are a bit later, always later and later. And the Court of Cassation says to the court, should I understand you judgment in Tarico, which is not finished, huh? Offenses in 2005, we are 2017, answer of the court in 2019, answer of the court, national court in 2000 and above 20. But should I understand your decision in Tarico as forcing the Italian judge to disapply the legislation? Whereas 
It is this disapplication, and I quote, it's against overriding principles of the Italian cons constitution and that runs against inalienable rights of the individual conferred by the Italian constitution. And we are coming to a, I would say, a new problem, a new question which is coming more often and more often at the court, the question of the constitutional identity. Constitutional identity which is more and more invoked by the member states when EU law is not good. So there is something special which gives me the possibility not to respect the primacy of EU law. The preliminary reference of the Supreme Court of Italy has been recently introduced in the court and uh, probably you will have to expect a decision 15 months from now and it will be in very interesting, in interesting to see the opinion of the Advocate General and the decision of the court. I know I've been too long, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always uh, good to listen to you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> yeah, Annette, uh, would you like to continue from the perspective of uh, the German Bundesfinanzhof, yeah. the World Tax Court? <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Good morning from me as well. Yeah, rather than going into specific decisions by the German Tax Supreme Court, I would like to talk to you about uh, special means a court system should actually contain in order to protect the taxpayer. These means for most of us are quite self-understanding because we do have a functional judiciary system, but for many countries they still actually present a real challenge. First of all, I think the taxpayer should be able to challenge the, a decision or the tax <coughs> assessment by the inland revenue, still within the inland revenue, and ideally free of charge. Um, ideally, a, a tax inspector, which is a different to the one that actually assessed the tax, looks at the case again in full and with an, a completely objective view. The decision by the Inland Revenue then should be final and the taxpayer should actually be able to appeal it in court. When I talk about a court, I mean an independent and impartial court. Independent on the one side from the Inland Revenue and also from the politics, from any political influence. Also independent, on the other hand, from um, the taxpayer and from the industry, which means the court is not at all corruptive. Access to these courts should be um, possible for all taxpayers, regardless of the value of their claims and also regardless of their individual wealth. There shouldn't be a threshold, so it means that also smaller cases should be taken to a court because sometimes they can contain a very uh, interesting and meaningful legal question. And if a taxpayer doesn't have the um, personal mean to afford to challenge his case in court, there should be a system in place that actually gives him some legal aid and also leads to a form of representation. Um, by the way, talking about representation, I'm quite a fan of at least opening up the courts of first instances to the taxpayer to represent himself. Um, I used to work for the um, Munich Court of um, Fiscal Court, which is a court of first instance, and our experience wasn't too bad. The taxpayers are usually very honest. The court is there to help them at least to, to, to phrase their questions, and the outcome isn't necessarily bad. I'm, I'm very um, aware that that's not possible usually at the Court of Appeal because the questions in case um, are usually a lot more complex, but at least in a two-tier system, the Court of First Instance, the taxpayer should be able to represent um, himself. When it comes to filing the claim, um, there could be several means for ex to help the taxpayer. For example, if he um, misses a deadline, there could be a mean to restitute him to the previous condition if he has good reasons that he actually missed the deadline. 
And the other thing in this um, early proceeding stage is that usually when a taxpayer files a claim or appeals against a tax assessment, it usually doesn't necessarily mean that the collection of the taxes is suspended. So there should be a mean in place to actually have a suspensive effect for the collection of the taxes, again, if the appeal is going to be more or less uh, successful. When it comes to the hearing stage, um, the taxpayer should be granted with a fair trial. He, uh, it's one of the substantial rights, is the, the right to a fair trial. <laughs> The German system, in my opinion, has got um, quite an effective mean. In Germany, um, the, the onus, the, the burden of delivering facts and figures is not only on the parties, which means on the taxpayers or on the inland revenue, but also on the courts. The court has to find facts and figures on its own motion. It has to communicate with the parties. It has to hear witnesses and expert witnesses. And it has to at least communicate the specific um, questions which they're going to actually uh, put the emphasis on in its decision later on. They have to communicate them to the parties in order for the parties not to be surprised later on by the court's decision. If finally we come to a court decision, again, in an ideal world, um, that could, should be appealed against um, at a court of appeal. I personally, or in Germany, we do have a two-tier structure and we have got very specialized financial courts that has worked out very well. Um, ideally, because nowadays the inland revenues usually don't have the time and the, the staff anymore to really uh, go into the cases and to declare the facts and the figures, um, ideally you have a three-tier structure. So you have two tiers where the courts actually find the facts as well as the law, and then finally the decision can be appealed um, at a court of appeal um, just on a question and a point of law. The final decision, and that is definitely more applicable to Court of Appeals rather than Court of First Instances, in my opinion should be clear, it should be understandable for all parties and it should be sustainable. Um, I think one of the, um, the biggest, the greatest arts of a court is to draft a decision that makes a difficult um, a tax question or a tax decision um, to formulate it in easy words so that not only the parties to the case but only also third people know what the court means by that because many in many cases um, the case will be precedent for other taxpayers and the taxpayer has to have some certainty and some uh, yeah some knowledge how to actually arrange his uh, tax affairs and finally, in my opinion, the, the court's decisions should also be sustainable. The court should definitely think about their decision rather sometimes longer than, than too briefly, then come to a, a profound uh, conclusion, um, get, basically give all the arguments they have taken for it, and then they shouldn't really change their opinion in the next two to three to five years because one of the fundamental rights, I think, for the taxpayer also is to rely on a sustainable uh, jurisprudence um, in order to arrange their tax affairs in a, in a proper way. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's uh, quite interesting to have uh, uh, representatives of two different courts with uh, very different concepts. Uh, the European Court of Justice consisting of uh, generalists, uh, whereas uh, the Bundesfinanz of a highly specialized uh, court, so uh, two very different concepts. And I think also your last remark is uh, very interesting, uh, that uh, whenever that courts should not uh, change too often uh, their position, I would add, if they change, they should disclose that they change their position, which I sometimes uh, uh, do not uh, see in the case law of the European Court of Justice, because <laughs> if you read the case law, you get the impression there is consistency over years, but if you compare some of the judgments, uh, I think you're not uh, that sure anymore about that. Uh, but uh, uh, 
Uh, I think uh, we are a bit running out of time, so what I would like uh, to invite uh, the panelists, uh, maybe very brief remarks, uh, what they think in, in international institutions uh, or courts, international courts, uh, which role they should have and what should uh, uh, be uh, 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 yeah, achieved in order to uh, better protect uh, taxpayers' rights in the future. Uh, who would like uh, to start? So we have the same order as we had before? Fine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think there are eight uh, key principles that should be considered. Maybe you can restrict yourself to three of them? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the first principle is that the tax must be in the law, so tax levied uh, uh, only by virtue of law. The second is legal uncertainty. The third is uh, fiscal secrecy and data protection. Uh, the fourth is uh, sound tax administration. So the tax administration move from a control to a service approach and respect all principles. Uh, the first is lawfulness. Um, then presumption of honesty and truthfulness. So the tax administration trusts the enclosed documents, data information, until there is a reasonable suspicion not to do so. Then the burden of proof, uh, general rule and circumstances justifying a reversal of the burden of proof. And finally, the measures to deal with breaches of taxpayers' code by both taxpayers and tax authorities. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was brief. Yeah, John, is uh, taxpayers' rights the next uh, big project the OECD has on the agenda? Uh. <laughs> well, I think it's important I think it's important to acknowledge that there is, um, within the existing work program, some elements that do impact on uh, taxpayer certainty. One is clearly the globalisation of the standards that have been developed in the context of the BEPS project. Um, and we have now what the Global Forum, we have the Inclusive Framework, and um, embedded in those uh, institutions and practices are elements that pertain to taxpayer rights, issues like confidentiality and the appropriate use of information. So. There's extensive work going on in the OECD globalising those rights. Um, we have uh, new peer review processes being brought in. Um, obviously, the MAP is, uh, is perhaps the most significant, but also in the context, for example, of CBC. And we, of course, have the Global Forum, uh, which, uh, which also works in that space. We have a deepening collaboration between tax administrations uh, and by necessity off the back of the BEPS project, which now puts the tax position and the counterparty jurisdiction into question as a relevant question for your own tax jurisdiction, we must reach out to other tax administrations to understand what they're doing. And that collaboration, which is in its early stages, has tremendous potential to produce um, uh, reliable and consistent outcomes for taxpayers and make sure that we have uh, standardisation in that space. And I guess finally, we do have um, uh, some interesting changes taking place in the measurement space. Uh, Christoph talked before about um, uh, the the TADAT work, but that's off the back of a, uh, what's been with ISORA, which is um, uh, a now tax survey process which picks up 100, over 100 tax administrations and picks up relevant measurements in relation to those tax administrations on some important materials in relation to taxpayer certainty. So return filing, uh, training, collection of taxes, also enforcement, picks up information on how their appeal and review processes work, whether they have uh, specific mechanisms for managing taxpayer complaints. So we now have, through our participation in the ISORA, which is, brings in IOTA, uh, and the IMF and a number of organisations, a very a large body of collective information where we can make intelligent comparisons between tax administrations as to what they're up to and really expose uh, uh, the internal workings of tax administrations to critical review in that context. So I think those are sort of the four areas that are, uh, are already in train in the context of the post beps environment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Helen, what lies ahead of us? Well, very much in, on the same line, um, we, we, we should use uh, as much as possible the, the instruments we already have. Um, concerning the tax gap, we do have some kind of measurement and we'll go down this road. Uh, we're working very um, intensively on the cooperation, administrative cooperation, meaning that we're trying to, to create a condition of working together. Um, 
joint audit, um, old programs, just workshop, um, possibility for the member state to deal with an issue and to uh, be uh, uh, to be associated with others, um, all the uh, fiscalis program funding this kind of initiative. Um, we definitely need to um, enhance the cooperation from the very beginning of the uh, uh, taxation, just uh, identify the uh, possibility to improve uh, the tax collection until we got the recovery of, uh, of, of, the, of the claim. So this is essential. these are essential tools we do have legislation about and we need to uh, make sure that this legislation is properly Im um, implemented. Um, for that we also have to encourage some kind of training, some kind of also guidance, guidelines, best practices and this is what we, we, we are involved in just to make sure that the condition of a proper relationship between the tax authorities and uh, the business or the, the uh, uh, taxpayers are created because this is um, the relationship as, is absolutely central to this uh, objective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Melchior? Thank you. <coughs> I have six conclusions but I'm going to skip the first four. <laughs> <laughs> At least the good news. <laughs> first of all, of course, the, the case law has to be constant, but it's unavoidable to have uh, some evolution because the problems are different, the court is different, the climate is different. And uh, what I'm asking for to the courts is to explain when the case law is changing, when there is an evolution. Of course, the fight against tax evasion and tax fraud, the court had said in 86, it is never an explanation or a justification for any restriction. I do not take that into account. Of course, it has changed progressively, but it has changed, but it should be explained. I think on this point it has been done. But evolution, yes, surely, legal certainty, and when there is an evolution, an explanation. Second conclusion, the courts cannot do, may not do everything to protect the member states for the European Union or to protect the taxpayer. We have a need for legislation and common legislation. And I'm not sure that the member states in the European Union have the will to progress together in this field. They have, each of them, the idea that, it should, that they should remain sovereign to protect their budget, and then any common action is not probably very useful. And that's the reason why, perhaps, soft law of the OECD has had more importance, thank you, more importance than hard law, at least at the level of the European Union. And that's true also for any other member states or any other state in the world. I've read that President Obama had began to fight the tax system of Delaware. Oh, good news. But it began in December 2016. <laughs> That's a sign of a very important political will, don't you find? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I can just add on to what John was saying. I think for us at the national courts, it's very important that cases don't come to us after many, many years, but more or less freshly. We're still, the parties they are alive and the facts are be more or less present. So the collaboration of the uh, inland revenues between each other, I think, is one of the most important points, especially when it comes to cross-border issues. We've seen uh, very good examples of that already in Germany, especially with the Bavarian government and its neighboring countries, and I think there's a lot of music lying in that. Yeah. I was just smiling because uh, you mentioned that the party should still be alive yeah. and I think uh, the, the chamber you are specializing in is inheritance tax law, uh, which is uh, quite a challenge, I would say. Yeah, having said that, uh, we are 
had been running out of time, so we, had, uh, we were stealing uh, some time of your lunch uh, break, which is an early lunch break, because uh, we should be back by one o'clock. So I would like uh, to thank all the panelists uh, for their input.